In this lecture, we will review the foundations of memory. Psychologists consider memory to be the process by which we encode, store, and retrieve information. Each of the three parts of this definition, encoding, storage, and retrieval, represents a different process. You can think of these processes as being a computer's keyboard. That's the encoding. The hard drive is the storage and software that accesses the information for display on the screen is the retrieval. Recognizing that memory involves encoding, storage, and retrieval gives us a start in understanding the concept. But how does memory actually function? How do we explain what information is initially encoding? What gets stored? And how is it retrieved? According to the three-system approach to memory that dominated memory research for several decades, there are different memory storage systems or stages through which information must travel if it is to be remembered. Historically, the approach has been extremely influential in the development of our understanding of memory, and although new theories have argued it, it still provides a useful framework for understanding how information is recalled. The three-system memory theory proposes the existence of three separate memory stores. Sensory memory refers to the initial momentary storage of information that lasts only an instant. Here, an exact replica of the stimulus recorded by a person's sensory system is stored very briefly. In a second stage, the short-term memory holds information for 15 to 25 seconds and stores it accordingly to its meaning rather than as mere sensory stimulation. The third type of storage system is long-term memory. Information is stored in long-term memory on a relatively permanent basis, although it may be difficult to retrieve. So let's review this in a little bit more detail. Sensory memory can store information for only a very short time. If information is not passed into short-term memory, it is lost for good. So, sensory memory operates as a kind of snapshot that stores information, which may be of a visual, auditory, or other sensory nature for a brief moment in time. But it is as if each snapshot immediately after being taken is destroyed and replaced with a new one. Unless the information in the snapshot is transferred to some other type of memory, it is lost. Now, let us review short-term memory. Because the information that is stored briefly in sensory memory consists of representations of raw sensory stimuli, it is not meaningful to us. If we are to make sense of it and possibly retain it, the information must be transferred to the next stage of memory, short-term memory. So, short-term memory is the memory store in which information first has meaning, although the maximum length of retention is relatively short. The specific process by which sensory memories are transformed into short-term memories is not quite clear. Some theories suggest that the information is first translated into graphical representations or images, and others hypothesize that the transfer occurs when the sensory stimuli are changed into words. What is clear though, however, is that unlike sensory memory, which holds a relatively full and detailed, if short-lived, representation of the world, short-term memory has 
incomplete representational capacities. The specific amount of information that can be held in short-term memory has been identified as seven items or chunks of information with variations up to plus or minus two chunks. A chunk is a meaningful grouping of stimuli that can be stored as a unit in short-term memory. A chunk can be individual letters or numbers, permitting us to hold a seven-digit phone number. But a chunk also may consist of larger categories, such as words or other meaningful units. So the transfer of material from short to long-term memory proceeds largely on the basis of rehearsal, the repetition of information that has entered short-term memory. Rehearsal accomplishes two things. First, as long as the information is repeated, it is maintained in short-term memory. More important, however, rehearsal allows us to transfer the information into long-term memory. Whether the transfer is made from short-term to long-term memory seems to depend largely on the kind of rehearsal that is carried out. By using organizational strategies called mnemonics, we can vastly improve our retention of information. Mnemonics are formal techniques of organizing information in a way that makes it more likely to be remembered. For instance, when a beginning musician learns that the spaces on the music staff spell the word face, F-A-C-E, or when we learn the rhyme, 30 days hath September, April, June, and November, we are using mnemonics. Please note, many contemporary memory theorists are now abandoning the term short-term memory, where short-term memory is referred to as working memory and defined as a set of temporary memory stores that actively manipulate and rehearse information. Working memory is thought to contain a central executive processor that is involved in reasoning and decision making. So now let us review long-term memory. Material that makes its way from short-term memory to long-term memory enters a storehouse of almost unlimited capacity. Like a new file we save on a hard drive, the information in long-term memory is filed and coded so that we retrieve it when we need it. Evidence of the existence of long-term memory as distinct from short-term memory comes from a number of sources. Just as short-term memory is often conceptualized in terms of working memory, many contemporary researchers now regard long-term memory as having several different components or memory modules. Each of these modules represent a separate memory system in the brain. One major distinction within long-term memory is that between declarative memory and procedural memory. Declarative memory is memory for factual information. Names, faces, dates, and facts, such as a bike has two wheels. In contrast, procedural memory or non-declarative memory refers to memory for skills and habits, such as how to ride a bike or hit a baseball. Information about things is stored in declarative memory. Information about how to do things is stored in procedural memory. Declarative memory can be subdivided into semantic memory and episodic memory. Semantic memory is memory for general knowledge and facts about the world, as well as memory for rules of logic and are used to declare other facts. 
Because of semantic memory, we remember that the zip code for Beverly Hills is 90210 and that Mumbai is on the Arabian Sea. In contrast, episodic memory is memory for events that occur in a particular time, place, or context. For example, recall of learning how to ride a bike, our first kiss, or arranging a surprise 21st birthday party for our brother is based on episodic memories. Episodic memories relate to particular contexts. For example, remembering when and how we learned that 2 times 2 equals 4 would be an episodic memory. The fact itself that 2 times 2 equals 4 is a semantic memory. Semantic networks suggest that knowledge is stored in long-term memory as mental representations of clusters of interconnected information. So, what causes difficulties and failures in remembering? Well, the tip of the tongue phenomenon is a temporary inability to remember information that one is certain one knows. Retrieval cues are a major strategy for recalling information successfully. The levels of processing approach to memory suggests that the way in which information is initially perceived and analyzed determines the success in which it is recalled. The deeper the initial processing, the greater the recall. Explicit memory refers to intentional or conscious recollection of information. In contrast, Implicit memory refers to memories of which people are not consciously aware, but that can affect subsequent performance and behaviors. Flashbulb memories are memories centered on a specific important event. The more distinctive a memory is, the more easily it can be retrieved. Memory is a constructive process. We relate memories to the meaning and expectations we give to events. Specific information is recalled in terms of schemas, organized bodies of information stored in the memory that bias the way new information is interpreted, stored, and recalled. Eyewitnesses are apt to make substantial errors when they try to recall the details of crimes. The problem of memory reliability becomes even more acute when the witnesses are children. And one last thing to remember, audiobiographical memory is influenced by constructive processes.